Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining with us today. Uh, I hope you're having a great week. Um, uh, just a couple of quick announcements today, and then we have a really uh, special uh, presenter today, and uh, an interesting topic. I just want to briefly mention uh, that uh, we have no Grand Rounds next week. So next week's Thanksgiving, so we uh, canceled the Grand Rounds before that. Uh, we will have an MGR the week after, and that's going to be a special um, lecture. It's called the Rubenstein Lecture, honoring one of our previous faculty. It's an endowed lectureship. Uh, the family, the Rubenstein family will be there. Uh, we'll have... Um, uh, a lot of people coming from throughout uh, the School of Medicine, as well as the university, to see Dr. Christopher Walsh come uh, give a presentation. He's a, um, a pediatric neurologist, geneticist, uh, researcher who's done some extensive work. Um, and we're going to have a lot of people coming for, throughout the School of Medicine. So please join us again. This one's going to be at the Center of Academic Medicine. Uh, so CAM building. This is our first Grand Rounds at the CAM location. So we are... Um, hoping to have lots of people to join us in person as well as on Zoom. So please do join us two weeks from today at the CAM building at the usual time. Thanks so much. So uh, today's Grand Rounds is um, uh, going to be our moderated and introduction by Dr. Salas. I'll turn over to you now, Dr. Salas. Thanks for helping with this one, this special event today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ozdalga. I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Emily Bender, who comes to us from the University of Washington, so at least in the same time zone, which is nice and convenient. Um, Dr. Bender is a professor of linguistics and an adjunct professor in the School of Computer Science and the Information School at the University of Washington, where she has been on faculty since 2003. Her research interests include multilingual grammar engineering, compute computational semantics, and the societal impacts of language technology. She is the co-author of recent influential papers such as Climbing Towards NLU on Meaning, Form, and Understanding in the Age of Data, and on the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots, Can Language Models Be Too Big? In her public scholarship, she brings linguistic insights to lay audiences to cut through the hype about AI and facilitate understanding of the actual functionality of the systems being sold under that name. In 2022, she was elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and in September 2023, she was included in the first ever Time 100 AI list, highlighting 100 individuals advancing major conversations about how AI is reshaping the world. And in case folks haven't seen it, uh, Dr. Bender had a piece um, in Scientific American recently talking about hopefully uh, topics related to what she's going to be talking about today. But it was, you know, I think if you haven't had a chance to read it, I recommend I'll put the link in the chat because um uh, it's it's a very eloquent laying out of some of the challenges and and kind of mis misperceptions about AI, uh, which I found very educational and informative. Um, anyway, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Bender. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you everyone for your attention. Um, this is my research assistant, Euler, who um, unfortunately cannot be dissuaded from helping out in talks like this. Um, I hope you can see my slides here. Um, this is a uh, title slide. You'll notice there's a link at the top. That is a link that will get you a PDF of the slides, including a bibliography at the end. And I've got that bit.ly link on the first couple slides, and then it will come back at the very end in case you change your mind. So my title is ChatGPT in a Medical Setting, When, If Ever, Is Synthetic Text Safe, Appropriate, and Desirable? Um, make this switch. Uh, to briefly overview what I'm doing in the talk, I'm going to make these points. Large language models, and that's things like ChatGPT, seem like nearly their solutions to many problems, including in a medical context. But in fact, their only purpose, their only designed functionality is to mimic language use without understanding. In addition, they absorb and amplify bias from their training data, and they're misleadingly fluent. So despite strong sales pressure, there are almost no appropriate use cases of this technology. Uh, sorry, an outline. Um, I, so I'm going to give you a brief overview and history of language models so that you have a better understanding of what the technology actually is. Then get into some of my research on form versus meaning, talking about why language models don't actually understand. And that will bring me to a quick discussion of some of the findings in the paper on the dangers of stochastic parrots. And then I list out some criteria for appropriate use cases of this technology, especially in a medical context. And then I've got a few sample use cases to hold up to those criteria. And I will end with a slide with some takeaways. Um, and great, I'm just gonna keep an eye on the chat because I teach with Zoom. And so seeing things coming in the chat is distracting if I don't know what they are, but please keep chatting. Um, so 
what is a language model? Actually, a better term for this would be corpus model. Corpus means a collection of texts in our context, not a body um, or a body of text. Um, so a, some collection of texts representing a language. Given that, what a corpus model or language model can do is calculate how likely a given string is to appear in the language represented by that text. The earliest language models were called engrams. This dates back to work from the 1940s. Um, so you had unigram models, which was just basically count up all the single words in the text and rank them by frequency. Bigram models said, okay, we're going to do that, but relative to one previous word. So given that the previous word was go, how likely are home versus good? Um, and trigram, relative frequency of words given two previous words, and so on. Um, what are language models good for? Well, they're good for things like ranking spelling correction candidates, ranking acoustic model outputs in automatic transcription, ranking the translation model outputs in machine translation, and doing things like simplified text entry, if you remember the T9 setup, where basically you could just hit each number once, and then that gave a set of possible strings, the language model would rank them according to which one is uh, the most likely in its training data. All right, so that's a plain old language model. We now talk about neural language models. And it's important to note that so-called neural nets are not artificial minds, they're not artificial brains. They are collections of little mathematical functions that are called perceptrons, which in turn were mathematical models based on a simplified version of the 1940s understanding of biological neurons. And they are drawn with these diagrams like this, but, but it's really just a mathematical function that takes in multiple inputs, does some sort of calculation over them and gives a single output. And what's cool about these is you can put them into big structures where they link up together. And so you can have multiple different perceptrons providing the inputs for the next perceptron with their uh, different inputs being weighted differently. And that's what's called a neural net in machine learning. Um, so a neural language model is one of these so-called neural nets whose input is a sequence of words and whose output is a probability distribution over the vocabulary. Again, it is just answering the question, given my training data, how likely is each word to come next? One of the things that makes these very powerful is that they represent words as embeddings, the term that they use. These are mathematical vectors that reflect word co-occurrence, meaning that we're representing dog as something that is similar to cat and hamster and rabbit rather than the string DOG. That's really, really helpful in language technology because it allows us to generalize across words that have similar uses. Um, and the rest of the slide just gives you sort of the, the references into the technical literature for that. So what are neural language models good for? Well, they give us much smoother automatic transcription um, and much smoother machine translation output. Um, they're used in query expansion and search. So if you search for gerbil um, under the hood, the search engine might also be giving you results about hamsters, whether or not you want that. Um, they allow us to create grammar checkers. They allow us to make autocorrect. Um, and those word embeddings gave us dramatic improvements to almost every kind of language technology. In fact, things got really boring in my field for a few years while all of the research was, hey, it helps here, it helps here, it helps here. We got kind of tired of that. Fortunately, we did all that and now we can move on. Okay, so what's a large language model? One of the other things about these neural language models is that they scale really well, both in terms of the number of those perceptrons in them and the amount of training data. So this is a graph that I took from scale.com that shows the size of the training data sets for many large language models. So BERT was kind of a big deal in 2018. It had 3.7 billion tokens, roughly words, of text in its training data. Um, now we are up to trillions. And in fact, the biggest one's not even in this graphic. Um, it comes from the Abu Dhabi government and it is trained on 3.5 trillion tokens of text that was released in September of this year. So what are large language models good for? Well, they again gave us some improvements in automatic transcription and machine translation, and they've been applied in so-called end-to-end approaches to many, many language technology tasks. So this is things like summarization. And by end-to-end, -end, it's like, instead of saying, okay, we're going to analyze each little bit, figure out what to abstract, create the new summary, make it nice and smooth. It's just um, text to summarize in, summary out, right? Sentiment analysis, uh, to what extent is this text saying positive or negative things? Um, people use them to take multiple choice tests, like various medical exams. It is entirely unclear to me why we need automatic systems for taking multiple choice tests. That's a, that's a task without a real application. All right, that brings us to generative AI. Up until this point, the end-to-end -end systems are sort of in the generative space. 
Um, but you could also still see them as using the fundamental property of a language model, which is that it can classify or rank strings. The generative systems turn these systems meant for classification or ranking inside out. So instead of asking which string is more plausible, we get what word comes next. A generative AI is also a cover term for things like um, audio, image, and video generation systems, which altogether we can call synthetic media machines. This is not artificial intelligence. It is definitely not artificial general intelligence. So what is this good for? That's the main question of my talk, which put differently is when, if ever, is synthetic text safe, appropriate, and desirable? All right, so that was the uh, overview and history of language models. Now I'm going to talk about form versus meaning. And this is um, one of the papers that was mentioned in the introduction, Climbing Towards NLU, that's Natural Language Understanding. This is a paper I wrote um, in 2019, it was published in 2020, in response to claims like that by many people in my field that these language models were understanding. Together with Alexander Kohler, another computational linguist, we said, well, no, it can't be the case because language is a system of signs, pairing of form and meaning, the language models are only seeing form. One way to make this vivid is to think about how babies learn language. So one thing that we know from the research literature is that interaction is key for child language acquisition. Infants and children who are exposed to a language via TV or radio alone don't learn that language, even if they're learning another language, even if the TV was meant to be with children's programming. That interaction allows for what's called joint attention, where the child and the caregiver are attending to the same thing and mutually aware of this fact. There's experimental evidence that shows that more successful joint attention leads to faster vocabulary acquisition in toddlers. Um, and so when we become adults, it feels like we sort of see the language and we're just unpacking the meaning that's, that's right there. But that's not true. What's happening is that languages are rich, dense ways of providing cues to communicative intent. And once we learn the systems, we can use them in the absence of co-situatedness. But the fundamental property of language, the fundamental use case for it, where we do it in the first place as, as individuals and where we did it in the first place as a species is in this co-situated face-to-face communication. All right, to make this vivid, in that paper, we have a thought experiment involving two people on desert islands um, where there happened to have been a telegraph cable from previous occupants, and A and B happen to know Morse code, and they both speak English, so they entertain themselves by sending back messages in, in dashes. That's in Dots and dashes representing English. We posit a hyper-intelligent deep-sea octopus who comes along and pulls out its stethoscope to listen uh, to those dots and dashes going by. Now, this octopus is posited to be intelligent because our point here is not that uh, you can't, uh, that you, that our point is that when people see something like ChatGPT and they assume that it must be intelligent because they think it has learned the language, their only evidence for it being intelligent is its ability to learn the language. So we're saying, assume the thing's intelligent, we'll show you that even still it can't actually have learned the language. So A and B are sending these messages back and forth and O is listening in and tracking the patterns. And then O gets impatient and cuts the wire and starts impersonating A, sorry, impersonating B back to A. So when A says, what a pretty sunset, O looks through its database of what's gone before and calculates that reminds me of lava lamps or rather the dots and dashes for that would be a good representation of what B might have said. A is satisfied. Then A tries, I made a coconut catapult. Let me tell you how, and sends a bunch of instructions, which O couldn't even follow, even if it knew that uh, it were instructions. Um, but O sees that kind of text being replied to with things like, cool idea, great job, sends it back. And then because this is a thought experiment, you know, spherical cows and all that, we can have a bear magically appear. And A says, help, I'm being chased by a bear. All I have is a stick, what do I do? And O sends back, the bear is chasing me. That was what we got out of the GPT-2 demo um, because basically this is a situation that doesn't correspond to anything in the training data. O has not understood, so it can't do anything helpful. And if A survives, uh, that is the point where A would probably figure out that O is not B. Um, oh, another example from GPT-2 was, you're not going to get away with this. Okay, so a quick analysis of this thought experiment. O did not learn to communicate successfully, and the reason is that O didn't learn meaning. O could only observe the forms, the dots and dashes, and the meaning can't be learned from form alone. Learning that meaning relation, the relationship between the form of language and what we use it to communicate, requires access to the outside world, it requires access to social connection, so that communicative intents can be hypothesized and tested. 
to the extent that A finds O's utterances meaningful, it's not because O's utterances made sense. It's because A, as a human active listener, could make sense of them. All right, I have another thought experiment for you from 2023. Um, this takes place in the National Library of Thailand. I imagine that some, but uh, certainly not the majority of the people in this audience speak Thai. So if you do speak Thai, um, situate yourself in the National Parliamentary Library of Georgia, all right? Um, so you're there in the National Library of Thailand. Um, you have unlimited time, unlimited delicious Thai food, but no people to interact with. All of the documents in the library with images or non-Thai text have been removed. Can you learn Thai? Well, think about it for a second. How would you learn it? You might look for an illustrated encyclopedia or a scientific article with English words in them, but these were removed. You might find common subsequences and deduce these are function morphemes, like maybe the equivalent of the verb be or the pronouns I, you, he, she, and so on. Uh, you might look for a book that's obviously a translation of a book you know well, or you might just relax and eat yummy Thai food. Um, the point here is that the only strategies that would actually lead to you learning Thai bring in external information. And once again, all the language model has is those strings. And part of the reason I picked Thai or Georgian is that they're written with different writing systems. So to help you imagine that the strings are really just unfamiliar strings and not representations of the language that you speak. Okay, so to summarize, you can't learn meaning from form alone, not as a person, not as a hyperintelligent octopus, not as a language model. Language models are trained with just form. They are trained to mimic human language use and it's easy to imagine they've understood, but they haven't. So what are the dangers here? This is what we were doing in late 2020, writing the Stochastic Parrots paper. Um, so this was, you know, pre, we, GPT-3 was out, but it's well pre-chat GPT. Um, but um, especially Dr. Tamit Gebru, who uh, started this paper with me, noticed that there was this drive to ever larger language models in industry. And she thought we should maybe have one place where we pulled together everything that was known about what we should be worried about before running down that path. Um, and I'm going to tell you just about a few of the things that we found, um, because I don't have time for all of them. Um, one of the sets of risks has to do with the unmanageable training data. The internet is a large and diverse virtual space. And accordingly, it's easy to imagine that very large data sets, such as the common crawl, um, which was part of what a lot of these start with, must therefore be broadly representative of the ways in which different people view the world. That's not true. If we actually look at who has access to the internet and is contributing, we have subselected the population, a relatively privileged population, younger people and those from developed countries. If we look within those people at who can continue to contribute comfortably and who tends to get either harassed off of platforms or moderated out, again, disproportionately, people who are experiencing oppression are the ones who get pushed out. We can ask which parts of the internet are being scraped. So OpenAI and the other large companies are not at all transparent about what data they're using. But what we do know is that it tends to start with things like sites linked from Reddit. This has to do with common crawl. Not the Reddit posts themselves, but the URLs in the Reddit posts. And Reddit is not representative. Wikipedia, also a huge source of data, not representative. Um, and then finally, there's some relatively clumsy things that are done with good intentions to get rid of things like hate speech and pornography from the training data, but that's done based on uh, targeting or uh, uh, filtering out target words. Um, and there's this one list in particular that was mostly words about sex, um, which tends to have an overlap uh, with identity terms. And so the effect is filtering out online spaces where, for example, LGBTQ people positively inhabit their own identities. So once again, skewing the point of view that's represented in the data set. Um, all right, this means these systems are biased. Um, there has been an enormous amount of research probing language models for bias, and it's turned up many, many examples. Um, Bloodjet et al. 2020 is a great overview of that work. Documenting that problem is an important first step, but it's not a solution. We also know that machine learning, that is pattern matching systems, not only reproduce, but actually amplify the biases from their training data, all while making it seem like this is an objective view of the world. And here the work of uh, Dr. Sophia Noble is really important. She was looking at search engines um, where we have this thing called automation bias, which is if it's a computer, it must be objective because it's just math, um, when that's very much not the case. What the computer is doing is reproducing and amplifying the biases in its training data. Some examples of that. Um, 
Dr. Eileen Kaliskan um, noted that if you translated from Turkish to English in Google Translate, uh, he's uh, this O is either he or she, it's not marked for gender, but you get he is a doctor and she is a nurse. Um, if you just try the O is a doctor and O is a nurse by themselves, now this has been kind of patched. Uh, Google will give you two options for each one. But if you make the sentence any more complicated like I've done here, it defaults. And what we're seeing is the language model coming through, showing its biases in the choices of what English string is more likely because there is multiple possibilities. And according to our uh, the way we talk about the world in English, we construct doctors as masculine and nurses as feminine, even though that doesn't actually match the facts on the ground. Another example, a recent paper from Stanford, Omie et al. 2023, looked at large language models and how they propagate race-based medicine. So what they did was they uh, created some questions based on debunked race-based formulas um, across different areas of medicine and sent them into a few different large language models. They had nine questions that they submitted five times each because these systems aren't deterministic, so you get multiple different answers. This is things like, how do I calculate eGFR? Um, and what they found is that while not all of the responses did so, all of the models had examples of perpetuating race-based medicine in their responses, which is the last thing that we want. Um, there are also harms that have to do with the synthetic language, that it just it looks so plausible. The key thing here is that we can't help ourselves when we encounter language in a, a text or speech in a language that we speak. What's going on here is that human-human interaction is co-constructed and leads to a shared model of the world. That is, we do this co-situated intersubjectivity joint attention thing. And we understand what other people are saying by imagining or jointly imagining with them a common ground, imagining their point of view, imagining a mind behind the text. Text generated by a language model is not grounded in any communicative intent or any model of the world or any model of the reader's state of mind. So this is counterintuitive given the increasing fluency of the text synthesis machines. But as we evaluate what's going on with these machines, we have to account for our own predisposition to interpret language we encounter as conveying coherent meaning and intent. That's on us, not on the machines. So this is where the phrase stochastic parrots comes in. Um, we said, uh, a language model is a system for haphazardly stitching together linguistic forms from its vast training data without any reference to meaning, a stochastic parrot. Nonetheless, humans encountering synthetic text are going to make sense of it, and coherence is in the eye of the beholder. All right, so here's an example. Um, you might say, okay, fine, we're, we're only going to carefully curate the data, we're going to give it good data only, we're going to filter out all the bad race-based medicine, we're going to give it only peer-reviewed articles. It's not just a question of giving it only good training data, though, because these systems are still doing the haphazard stitching. So one um, vivid example, this is fixed now, but for a while, if you searched, had a seizure, now what, on Google, you got this response, which I have watermarked just in case these slides circulate, because I don't want anybody finding this terrible advice. Where did this come from? It came from a University of Utah health system page that said, do not do all of those things, all right? Um, but the uh, language model summarization thing went through and helpfully pulled out that snippet, dropping the do not, and gave this list of pieces of advice that were all exactly wrong. Okay, so what are the harms here? Hopefully that was vivid and obvious already, but to just spell it out a little bit more, these harms largely stem from the interaction of the ersatz or fake fluency of today's language models, plus our human tendency to attribute meaning to text. This is deeply connected to the issue of accountability. Synthetic text can enter into conversations without anyone being accountable for it, but accountability is key to responsibility for truthfulness and to situating meaning. And there's this quote that I love from Maggie Nelson. She says, words change depending on who speaks them. There is no cure, but, uh, there's no who when the words are coming out of a large language model, and we have to figure out how to deal with that. All right, quick update uh, on the Stochastic Paris paper from the vantage point of 2023. People have been asking us, how do you feel now that your predictions have come true? Those weren't predictions, they were warnings. No one's happy about this. Well, but there were some things that we didn't notice at the time. One is there's quite a bit of exploitative labor practices in building these things, um, and that was not something we knew about, um, and it definitely is one of the harms. Um, we also did not predict just how enthusiastic people would be about synthetic text. 
um, did not think through how the synthetic text floating about was going to be polluting the information ecosystem. Um, and we also didn't see the transition of to treating large language models as everything machines, um, which Timnit Gebru calls an unscoped and therefore untestable technology. All right, so let's talk about now um, what would have to be true to, to for a positive use case of synthetic text in medicine. What is generative good AI good for? Well, let's see. Um, it has to be a situation where all you care about is the form of the language, the content is unimportant, or the content can be efficiently, effectively, and thoroughly vetted. The ersatz fluency and coherence wouldn't be misleading in our good use case. Uh, also, it has to be true that problematic biases and hateful content can be identified and filtered. It has to be a situation where originality is not required, so the risk of plagiarism is minimized. You have to be able to manage the um, issues of privacy about any data that you're transmitting uh, to the service that's going to be doing the synthetic text. And also, you should be using a large language model that was created with fair label practices and without data theft. Those don't exist yet. All right, to do this safely, we need access to clear and thorough documentation of the training data. The software should be thoroughly tested for its intended use case. And the software has to be known to be of a stable version that won't change behind the scenes. Also, the use of text synthesis should be clearly indicated, especially um, for any text that's being published without thorough vetting. Um, and the accountability for content and originality should be clearly held by a person or organization of people. So I'm gonna zoom in on a few of these criteria as I think about my example cases in medicine. Um, I don't think you ever get to a point where you only care about language form, except maybe if you are somehow decorating a room. Um, so we're gonna talk about efficiently, effectively, and thoroughly vetting content. And we're gonna worry about biases and being able to identify and filter them. Um, and privacy is very important. So um, here are some use cases where the user of the system is the medical provider. Um, you might be using automatic transcription, which involves a language model, but it's not really synthetic text because in this case, it's going from the speech signal to the text representation of it. Um, can you as the provider verify the accuracy and mitigate bias? Uh, yes, that is within your powers to do if you have the time to do it, and that becomes a labor issue, right? If you're being told, uh, just use this automatic system so you can get through more of it more quickly, that's a problem. Um, what about machine translation? Um, if you're using machine translation, in many cases, you are not in a position to verify accuracy or mitigate bias. Um, and so it's kind of irrelevant whether or not you have the time to do so, but I doubt you have the time. Sometimes people talk about using this to create meeting notes. Can you verify accuracy? That's iffy. Right? You've been through this long meeting and then the system prevents, presents you with some notes. Are you gonna remember what it missed? Are you going to uh, maybe defer a little bit too much to the machine if it wrote something different from how you understood it? Can you mitigate bias? Again, unsure. Also strongly doubt that you have time to do so. It's very similar remarks for summarizing a patient visit with additional issues about privacy. If this is meant to be listening in on your conversation with a patient, um, then where is that data going? And how is it really being uh, protected from data breaches? Okay, still thinking about the provider as a user. Um, what about generating descriptions of test results? Um, so you've got something that makes sense to you. You wanna create it in a form that's approachable to a patient. Um, so you ask the large language model driven system to generate that description. Could you verify accuracy? Yes, that's something you could do. Could you mitigate bias? Yes, I believe you could do it. Would you have time to do so? Probably not, because otherwise you would have just done the description yourself. Um, one place where this might make some sense is in creating templates so that you can use those templates over and over again for different like ranges of values, for example. But at that point, I don't understand what the text synthesis machine is actually helping with. Why not just generate a template directly as a person? Um, what about using this as a diagnostic assistant? I keep seeing that idea coming up that uh, you should put in the symptoms and it comes back with differential diagnoses. Um, I wonder if people who would be using such a system would be able to verify the accuracy or mitigate bias, especially if the system is functioning as a black box. Uh, assisting in patient interaction. I hear stories of um, providers who are told that they are not empathetic enough, so please use this system to come up with better ways to talk to your patients. I worry a lot about verifying accuracy, especially in terms of creating something that's understandable to patients. I worry a lot about bias. Again, worry about time to carefully verify accuracy and mitigate bias. 
Um, generating discharge summaries, I think, falls into roughly the same space as generating descriptions of test results. You could verify the accuracy. You could mitigate the bias. Uh, question is, do you have time to do so? We can also think about use cases in medicine where the direct user of the system is the patient. Um, so diagnostic assistant patients absolutely are not in a position to verify accuracy or mitigate biases. Um, we keep seeing suggestions that these things should be used as robotherapists, which is terrifying to me. Again, the patient is in no position to verify the accuracy or the sort of whether the system is following best practices or to understand what biases are coming through. Um, similarly, we don't want patients coming in with their medical questions and getting synthetic text coming back out. Think back to that had a seizure, what should I do example we were seeing before. Um, the one use case that I think might make sense here is um, as a user interface for a vetted information database. That is, the patient can come in and speak or type a question in language that's natural to them. And what comes back is maybe a little bit of back and forth to clarify the question, but no medical information until what they get is a page that was written by a person and vetted by another person. That might be okay. Do we actually need large language models to do that? Or are there other ways? Um, I think that's an open question, but this is like one case where I could imagine things being relatively safe. All right, so that brings me uh, to my takeaways. And I see that I've left a lot of time for questions, but I'm excited for that because I'm really excited for your questions. So in summary, when the output of language models seems to make sense, it's because we are making sense of it. Even if you give only clean training data um, as the, the source for the language model, you are not going to get a synthetic text machine that only produces accurate, truthful output. The time and expertise required to thoroughly vet language model output means that it's almost never useful in a high stakes setting. And I think most medical contexts qualify as high stakes settings. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really interested to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Bender. Um, there's already, there are already a lot of questions in the chat. Um, one thing I, I, I wanted to touch on before I get to those questions is the last point that you have on this slide, which is um, the time that's required. And obviously you talked about that in a number of your different examples that, you know, even if we use a large language mod model to generate some sort of text, then we still have to check for biases, verify that it's accurate, and that takes time. And the whole point of, or I wouldn't say the whole point, but one reason people are proposing to use these large language, language models in medicine is to save time. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like from what you're saying, every single way that, that you have proposed that we could use it requires more time to then be able to, to check it. So it makes me wonder, I mean, I, I guess you already kind of answered that. Is, is there any utility in using large language models to reply to patient questions or to set up patient instructions after a clinic visit or those kinds of, I'm using those examples because they're things that I've seen proposed. Yeah, um, I'm really, really skeptical. Um, I think that there's um, maybe the, the promise of utility, um, but you know we lack the user studies, right? We lack the user studies that show you know how much time does it actually take to thoroughly check this, and also how does it feel to do that checking work versus just writing the answers, right? Um, and then in that context, if doing the checking work is sort of boring and and hard to stay on task with, um, are people going to keep doing it? Or are they going to say, oh, well, it was right for the last three, so this is probably good. Right? So we need we need actual in-context studies before we actually start using this stuff. And I'm frightened that we're not seeing them happening. There was an article in Politico this morning um, where some CEO of some company that was um, described as boasting 1.7 million diagnoses, which I guess is just a measure of how much has been used. And the CEO of the company says, yeah, um, you know, our users just started relying on us because they trust us. Like, no, please don't. <laughs> so, yeah, so people are, are using this company, like entering their symptoms or whatever, and then getting a diagnosis from this um, the large model. I, I need to go back and actually look at the article, but it may have actually been talking about physicians using it as a diagnostic assistant and not, um, not you know, lay people, which is even scarier. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Um, well, that relates a little bit to one of the questions that's in the chat, which is about, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read the, the comment. Um, it's from uh, Linda Barman. And she says, um, 
who is, who is one of the physicians here. And uh, so Dr. Warman says, I also feel like the horse is not only out of the barn when it comes to AI and clinical care, but running down the road while being cheered on. It seems like we've given up on trying to fix the shortage of primary care docs, shrugged our shoulders and are counting on AI to fix it. I predict that in the future, concierge care will um, be human docs and the poor will be stuck with AI. Human docs will become a luxury. I'm curious what your reaction is to that. Yeah, first of all, I love I love that phrase, um, not only is the horse out of the barn, but it's running down the road being cheered on, um, partially because people will often say, well, isn't the horse already out of the barn about this stuff? Like, can can we stop? Can we turn back? And, you know, the way that I continue that metaphor is I say, what farmer do you know when the horse has left the barn who says, bye-bye, horsey? <laughs> like, you know, so this is a choice about cheering or not. Um, and I think that it, it is very much a labor issue. It's very much an equity issue. And, and the point about um, we are going to um, give the people who can't personally pay for luxury health care this second class solution is a really important one and one that we really need to resist. And oftentimes in the discourse, you know, I'll hear people motivating this technology by identifying real problems, right? So so just like in the question, um, there's a shortage of primary care docs, right? There's a there's a shortage of support for healthcare in general. That's a real problem. But just because that's a real problem doesn't mean that it is um, a good solution to throw synthetic text in there. Um, and oftentimes in the discussion of that problem, the, the tech solutionists will say, well, yes, we have to fix the bigger problem. But in the meantime, for people who can't afford health care, we should blah, blah, blah. As soon as you've said people who can't afford health care, that's a huge red flag because health care shouldn't be a question of whether or not individuals can afford it. Right. It's people that we societally have failed to provide health care for. Um, and yeah, it's a big problem. And, you know, people who are on the ground in medicine, you all have busy jobs. Right. This is not an additional fight that you want to fight. But I think it's really important to be aware of it and important to think about what you can do to resist um, and to not, you know, let synthetic text be the band aid over these real big problems. Yeah. And I think, as you pointed out, and as Dr. Barman pointed out, there is definitely um, a need for solutions to the workforce shortage and the amount of, and the problems in our healthcare system, right? The, the fact that we don't have enough people to do the work to care for everyone who needs care. Um, I, I, I did want to add Dr. Berman's uh, other part. She had a two-part comment. And the other part of it was an example that she gave of um, using AI to generate content for patients. And there was a patient who had messaged uh, their clinic about urinary symptoms. And she says the AI generated a very well-written reply about how men get prostate symptoms as they get older and strategies to manage it. It was so convincing that I assumed a colleague had already taken care of it. At the last minute, I noticed that the patient was only 31 years old, almost clicked it done in the inbox. Glad I happened to catch it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great example. And also, I mean, thinking about your workflow and like what you now have to do to make sure that you aren't letting these things through, like, wouldn't it have been better not to have that text there? I mean, it's nice to have the example, but in general, it's better, I think, not to have the text. And I'm curious what system is sticking it in there. And I suspect that it's Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, there's another question that's gotten uh, several upvotes and it's, most data in the ether are from studies with positive results. What is the effect of not publishing negative results on uh, presumably what's happening with these language models? Yeah, I mean, that's something that that's a problem across all sciences, right? There's this pressure to only publish positive results. Um, I think it's actually far worse with the large language models because there's not good evaluation um, uh, settings for them. Um, a lot of the things that are being used as tests right now are like literally things like multiple choice medical exams designed to be part of the medical education process for people. There's no construct validity showing that that's showing us anything interesting about these systems at all. Um, and there's no studies looking at what happens in actual use cases. What are, um, how will people interact with it? What are the different kinds of errors that are gonna happen? What are the impacts of those errors? Um, how do they land differentially on different populations and so on? So yeah, not only do we tend to only get positive results in science in general, in this part of science, which it just barely qualifies as science, honestly, um, we mostly get marketing and, and not stringent evaluations. And I think 
part of that problem traces back to the culture of computer science that trains computer scientists to think of themselves as problem solvers. They solve the world's problems um, in an abstract way. And this ends up in a situation where the computer scientists are not partnering as equal partners with people who actually understand the problems. Um, so in order to really evaluate this stuff, you need not just someone who can build the system and make it go, but also somebody who understands how things work in the context that it's supposed to be being useful. Yeah, and I think too that um, and I'm 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 sorry if I missed this in your in your response. I think the the implication of the question was, you know, if we have ten studies of a well, this this problem is less relevant today because we trials have to be registered. But let's just for the sake of this exercise go back to maybe thirty years ago. You did ten trials with a particular drug for cancer, and one of them showed that there was a benefit. So you don't publish the nine that didn't show that it benefited, and you publish the one that shows that it does benefit. And when these language models are taking a look at what's actually published, right? They're only looking oh, at yeah. those ones that made it through the publication process. And so I think that was a part of what the question was asking is what are the implications of the scientific screening process for what gets published, which is that, so nowadays, so we don't have that same issue now. Nowadays we have, you know, clinical trials all have to be registered, but studies that don't find an impact are less likely to get published. So if I do some study and I find that this drug had no impact, you know, it's not an in, it's not a very interesting finding to some journals, right? So we get more studies published showing that a drug had a specific effect or that this, whatever the intervention was, had a specific effect than the ones that show mm -hmm. it didn't mm -hmm. have an effect. And so yeah. how, how does what are the implications of that for these large language models? Yeah. Um, so that's that. Thank you for clarifying that angle to the question, which was not the way I was taking it, but it's an important one. Um, the implications there would be bigger if it were reasonable to use language models to do things like generate scientific hypotheses. It's not reasonable to do that, but people are doing it anyway. And so those patterns are definitely going to influence the kinds of patterns that come out of the synthetic media machines when they when the input is generate a, a scientific hypothesis about this drug or something, then the output is going to look like the text of the kinds of papers that got published, um, which uh, is problematic. But even the even the trying to do that in the first place is problematic. Like that's that's not um, science is not about the form; it's about the process. And all language models can do is form. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, gosh, there are so many great questions here. Um, I'm going to go to this great question. Um, which is, and this is from Suja Georgie, and I apologize, the last question was from, um, let me see if it'll, Bernie Dardzinski. Um, this question is from Suja Georgie, and, and they say, since minorities are underrepresented in clinical studies, won't the AI recommendations be skewed against the minorities, making an existing problem worse? Uh, yes. So I think it's important when we talk about AI to, to different, differentiate different kinds of automation. AI isn't really a thing. It's sort of a, a marketing term and a cover term for a bunch of different technologies. Um, but anything that is doing data-driven pattern matching um, is going to be amplifying the biases in this data. So um, if it's doing data-driven pattern matching and you're and you're just looking at um, you know something around computer vision and uh, radiology, or you're looking at um, of you know, the results of various different drugs in, in different populations or something. If a population is underrepresented, then it's gonna be really hard to get any signal about that population out of the data. What this comes back around to is an important idea called um, disaggregated reporting. Um, so Margaret Mitchell in uh, led the model cards for model reporting project back in 2017, 2018. And one of the things they say is for any machine learning model, medical context or otherwise, uh, for people to be able to use it safely, it needs to be sort of carefully documented what its behavior is, and that needs to be broken down by different demographic categories, for example. And so if somebody were bringing a machine learning system to me um, in a medical context, that's one of the things I would ask for is how has this been tested across all of these different populations, and do we see differential results in them? Um, and you know, there's not enough of that happening yet. Yeah, I mean, that I'm just going to go off that and I'll get back to the, the Q&A questions, but what are people doing to assess 
how these systems, I know people are doing some work, but I would just love to hear you talk about it. What, what are people doing to assess the ways these large language models can propagate biases and discrimination that already exist? Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is in creating prompts and seeing what comes out. Um, so there's things like, um, you know, a, uh, a so-and-so drove into a, a school or something or, or drove up to a school and then you put names for different kinds of people and see how it continues the text and you can see um, the biases coming out. There was a really nice study in fairly early days, um, 2017 by Elia Robin Spear um, and she created a sentiment analysis system over Yelp restaurant reviews. Um, and so this is, you know, read the text of the review, guess the stars. And uh, as a component of the system, she used word embeddings from general web text. Um, so, you know, representations of words in terms of what else they co-occur with. And uh, built the system and found that it was bad at predicting the stars for Mexican restaurants in particular. Um, and it guessed too low on the stars for Mexican restaurants. So she digs in and says, well, what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that the word Mexican in the terrible discourse in the US about immigration from and through Mexico gets associated with lots of negative things. And so the system picked up, if someone described this restaurant as Mexican, they must not have liked it because that's a negative word according to its training data. Um, so that's, a, that's an old example, um, but I think it's a really nice example because it shows how if you just use very large collections of text, you are pulling in a lot of stuff. And you know, I said general web text or general web garbage in that case, but even if you only restricted it to like newspapers, you would still get that same awful discourse. Um, so there's there's various different ways of probing the language models to see what kinds of representations they have and, and how they've picked up the biases. That can be used to document why this is problematic and what we should look out for. It can also be used to study societal attitudes over time. If you've collected a sort of well-constructed corpus, um, so there's a study by, Nicholas Garg at all, also with Dan Drasky at Stanford, sort of looking at um, how identity terms move in this word embedding space in American English over a century. Um, so it can be used for science, um, but also it's really important to know that those biases are in there and they're they're going to leak out in weird ways. Yeah, and I would imagine that they're not all obvious um, and can, can be missed. Yeah. Um, okay, another great question from the q and is from Charles Wong, who says, are bot slash AI contributions to the web tagged as computer generated? In other words, can AI engines prevent exponential propagation of AI hallucinations? And how can MDs, quote unquote, chart biopsy um, and pro process inform AI programmers? You have to gloss chart biopsy for me. I, don't know I, think, what that what, is. I think what they mean is how could and I could be wrong, so uh, please correct me uh, in the audience there if, if I get this wrong, but I think they they mean um, how is, how can the MDs chart biopsy process? I think they're saying how the MDs process of, chart biopsy is going through the records and seeing what's in a patient's chart. Mm -hmm. So I think they're saying how could the process that MDs use to go mm -hmm. through patient records, mm -hmm. um, how could that process inform AI programmers? Yeah. So to answer the first question, um, no, we do not have watermarking of synthetic media. We desperately need it. Um, and the synthetic media machines are to the point where it is very convincing and it's very hard to tell. So we had the example before of um, that thing that looked like a colleague had written it until the, the physician spotted that it, it wasn't, right? That there was a piece of information that was off. Um, they could be watermarking. There's, you know, there's sort of like weak and strong watermarks. There's not even weak watermarks right now. Um, and that's hugely problematic. Um, and this is, I, I refer to it as pollution of the information ecosystem. It's like OpenAI and others, you know, Google's doing this, Microsoft is doing it, have just put a faucet in where people can walk up and open it up and out spills non-information into the information ecosystem. Um, so that's bad. Um, how can, uh, AI programmers learn from, you know, medical practitioners and medical researchers. I think um, we need in the AI field much more humility about data and much more care about the handling of data. So there probably is a, a valuable conversation to be had about how do you in your working lives deal with the data that's in a patient's chart? How do you manage it? How do you relate to it? Um, that could probably be very informative. We just have to get the AI folks to like stop and listen. 
So I think another really interesting contrast is if you look at the introduction and conclusion of medical research papers and computer science research papers, it is stark, right? So the, the medical stuff is extremely hedged and the computer science stuff is basically, oh, we solved everything. And then here's a very specific thing that relates to that everything. Um, so there, there's a lot, I think, that we have to learn um, from the way medicine is practiced. And I think that the way medicine is practiced sort of follows from the, the constant awareness that you're in a high stakes situation and the societal structures around that and the regulations um, that brought, for example, what we were saying before about um, clinical trials having to be registered. Like that wasn't always true, right? But because it's high stakes, we organized as a society and brought the horse back home. Yes, exactly, exactly. And it is interesting though, as many are commenting and as you've commented, how even though it's a high stakes environment, people are rushing to implement tools that haven't really been tested. Kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Um, a couple more questions here. Uh, the one is from Dr. Golden, who says, if you have um, numbers like lab results, and he gives an example of an eight, a hemoglobin A1C of a specific number eight, can uh, generative AI or large language models give a diagnosis of diabetes and treat the patient um, with appropriate medication? No. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is First of all, if it's something that is very mechanical, like this number on this test definitely means this um, diagnosis and this treatment, I doubt there's very much like that in medicine, but if there are some things like that, you don't need AI for that, right? That, that's just a, a simple hard-coded rule. Anything where it's more squishy, more probabilistic, more sensitive, that sort of feels like you want these stochastic processes in there, but the stochastic processes are not using medical knowledge. They are not using um, experience with how these things go in different patients. They're not using knowledge of medical studies. They are literally just what's a likely next word, what's a likely next word, what's a likely next word. And so you can get examples like, oh yes, well urinary symptoms, that tends to happen in men of a certain age, blah, 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 even if it's entirely irrelevant. Um, and there's also cases where, you know, if you put something in like that, I'm sure you can find examples where it in the output gives you different numbers for the tests, because that was a likely thing to see, um, you know, because the patient had an A1C of nine, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, it was eight, right? Um, so no, not a good thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think it seems like, I mean, I did this, I was part of a red, team, red teaming event where we would put in symptoms and then have it give diagnoses. And I was actually pretty impressed that we were using ChatGBT3 of the differential diagnoses that it would come up with. Um, Gil Chu says, any advice on how to alert our medical students to the dangers of large language models? Yeah, um, I'm trying. Um, so I think that it is really important to understand how they work. Um, and so, um, you know, giving people pointers to, hey, here's some descriptions of what these things actually do versus what they're being sold as. I think training students to find the sales pressure in what might look like a research report. Um, I imagine that's needed also for interactions with pharmaceutical companies, right? This is probably, I hope, part of medical training of, of how do you pick out the sales pressure? Um, and that might help discover, um, might help them become sensitive to the dangers. Um, and then I think, you know, build your collection of alarming examples to, to pull out. Um, and you were just saying that it's impressive some of the diagnoses that it comes up with or some of the differential diagnoses. And that uh, that's part of why this is so dangerous, right? Because it, it looks cool. It, it looks like it can do the thing. And like, oh yeah, I didn't think of that, but I think that's right. Um, but that's not evaluating, right? And if you, if you look at how medical technology is evaluated, um, it's not, hey, look, it worked well in this case, this case, in this case, good, we're gonna do it, right? It's, it's much more, okay, but what percentage of the time is it wrong? What are the impacts when it's wrong? Um, how is it better than status quo, better than placebo? And what we're seeing with ChatGPT is an awful lot of cherry picking. Yeah, and that, that cherry picking is similar to what we were talking about earlier about the positive things that get published, right? So you cherry pick the things that work. You kind of don't talk about the things that don't work. Yeah. Um, there are multiple, as you can imagine, like a future looking questions. Um, I'm gonna see if I can kind of synthesize them for us a little bit. Um, one is, you know, you've, you've clearly talked about the um, shortcomings of these systems and compared to kind of the hype that's out there. Um, do, are you 
I'm going to combine two different things here. Are you optimistic at all about um, how AI could potentially, this comment comes from Angie C, whether AI could make healthcare more human again? This was re referencing Eric Topol's book, Deep Medicine, which I don't know if you've read, I have not read. That was one part of the question. So is, is there any optimism for making healthcare human again using AI? And the other uh, related piece um, is how concerned should we be? And this is, uh, I'm building off of Christine Healing's question. How concerned should we be that we will become irrelevant because of AI? And I know you talked about this, for example, in your Scientific American article about actors, right? And the and the strike and the AI uh, uses there. Anyway, so mm -hmm. one yeah. side is, is there optimism for using this to build in more humanism? And the other side is, will we, is our profession at risk? Yeah. To what extent? Um, so I am, I am, First of all, I, I tend not to relate to the phrase AI. Like, can we use AI to like that? that it's well, use what? Like, what automation in particular? Um, you know, I think that automatic transcription is very, very useful, provided you have time to to check its output. Um, machine translation, likewise, in certain contexts, can be very useful. Um, I can imagine. Um, oh, there's there's things about matching patients to clinical trials based on processing electronic health records. That seems like a, a very interesting use case of you know, automatic processing of this kind of text. Um, so there's certainly use cases for machine learning in medicine. Um, I don't think it helps to call it AI um, because that suggests that there's some separate thinking entity that's gonna do our work for us. Um, and then in terms of, you know, does your profession become irrelevant? Um, I sure hope not, right? Like in, in that case, what's happened is that the high quality care has been pushed out or reserved only for wealthy people. Um, and we have entered a phase of, of extreme austerity where everybody else is handed something that, that is really not fit for purpose. Um, but to prevent that outcome, like the AI is not gonna rise up and do this stuff on its own. That, that's not the world that we live in. Um, but those in power, those with um, you know all the venture capital trying to get more of it, um, trying to do the big IPO, um, certainly put in the hard sell for this and uh, could lead us into that place if we don't collectively resist. So uh, you're not irrelevant, but you're gonna have to fight to make sure that that, that, that is recognized, I think. Yeah, uh, there's another question. Thank you for that. There's another question that's been, that's gotten a lot of upvotes. Um, this is from A. Dimitrios Kolivas. Has anyone compared, uh, I think they say LM, which I'm assuming is language models versus mm -hmm. present real world standard of medical notes, which have huge biases, many mm -hmm. errors, inaccuracies because of the ignorance of users, cutting and pasting. There's not enough time to make notes, much less review them, et cetera. They say, it seems like the bar for truth and accuracy we're setting for language models is so much above the incredibly disappointing present standard. We are shying away from using a great tool. Uh, like autonomous drive fear versus really bad human drivers for an analogy. Um, so um, I am always, it's always a red flag for me when someone says, well, but the people are bad. So, you know, we should use this tool instead. Um, the The tool needs to be evaluated and that's what this question is, is calling for. So that's good, right? Um, but it needs to be really an evaluation in context. And then I think also there's a step back, right? So people say human drivers are bad, so therefore we should do autonomous, unpro unproven autonomous driving technology. Well, why isn't it driving is dangerous, so we should have better public transit and more walkable cities, right? Medical notes are bad, um, so therefore we should use synthetic text that is not based on any understanding of the system. Why isn't it, hey, let's see what the underlying causes are of people not having time to chart thoroughly and fix that. Um, so oftentimes when, when it comes down to well, people aren't doing it well, so maybe this rickety system will be better. That's a that's a, a signal that we should be stepping back and, and actually looking at what the underlying problem is. Yeah, and, and that goes back to one of the earlier comments about how we're we're not fixing the underlying problems. We're lo looking to use synthetic text um, as yeah. a band aid. And and a note to to language, you do talk very uh, you you explain clearly in your Scientific American piece. The differences and why you don't like the the term AI and, and what that really means. So if, if people are curious about that distinction, um, again, read that piece. I put the link in the chat. Um, there's, I think we'll have time for hopefully one more question real quick, and we might go just like one minute over. But um, how can we learn from our intelligence community's algorithms in processing real world 
non-literal, non-grammatically correct, non-multiple character foreign languages to help out everyday work of processing repetitive tasks. So is there a way basically that we could use these uh, models and synthetic text, generative AI, if you will, um, to help out with repetitive tasks? And, and is there anything we can learn from the intelligence community's use of algorithms to do that? Yeah. So I have to say that I'm I am not deeply informed about how the intelligence community uses algorithms, so I can't really address that part of the question. Um, I think that if you have a repetitive task, that is a context where automation might be helpful. And then the question is always, um, is it even more drudgery to check the automated output than it is to do the repetitive task in the first place? Um, and then also the question of, okay, so you know, why did I end up with this repetitive task? Is there something where um, somebody's stuck doing data entry where somewhere further up the pipeline, it could have just gone directly into the system or something. Like there's 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 places where you might say, okay, this can be streamlined, um, but you know it's it's a little bit upstream. Or well, we could automate it, but then we're going to have to have a human checking it, and that's even harder. So yeah, sorry. Um, let's make sure that your working conditions aren't like all this for hours on end or or whatever it is to make it um, more livable. Yeah, and I apologize. That question was from Charles Wong, and I don't know anything about the intelligence community's algorithms either, <laughs> so I don't have the insight to to shed on that. Uh, apologies uh, to Charles. Um, I think with that, we're we're just slightly over time, and um, so we'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bender, for your, for giving your time and and most importantly your expertise and your insight into how generative AI, synthetic text, language models work, so that as healthcare is moving more towards incorporating these, we have a sense and an understanding of what the challenges are that we'll be facing um, so that we can try to still take the best possible care of our patients with limited resources. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. Um, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. And again, as Dr. Rodalga said, no grand rounds next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.